Hi, this is Dr. Adam Tyson of the Greenville Health System Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Today we're going to talk about cesarean delivery. Um, it's an important topic in OB these days because approximately one-third of all births in the United States um, over the past, say, 10 years or so have been by C-section. And this is a dramatic rise over, say, the mid to late 90s because uh, we had a number of changes in the practice of obstetrics and a number of other factors leading to people making different choices about routes of delivery. So anyway, it accounts for a large number of uh, births in the U.S. now, and so it's a, a very common surgical procedure. It's probably the most common major surgical procedure performed, and there is a, a significant amount of risk and cost that goes involved in it, and that's a big difference over uh, traditional vaginal delivery. Uh, roughly speaking, the risk of maternal mortality is three times higher if uh, a cesarean delivery is performed. There's an increased risk of morbidity as well. And as I mentioned, increased cost. Now, this isn't to say that no one should ever have a cesarean delivery because there are certainly valid indications and there are times when failure to perform a cesarean uh, can lead to complications for both the mother and the baby. But we do want to be careful about when we do them, why we do them, and making sure that we're optimizing our, our technique when we do it. Uh, as I said, about one-third of all deliveries in the U.S. are done by C-section these days. The rate has held steady um, about 32 percent over the last few years and has plateaued, although there was a sharp rise, as I said, from the 90s when the rate was more like 25 percent. The disappointing thing about this is that we really haven't seen a lot of improvements in uh, fetal outcomes. And we have seen a big increase in uh, problems related to complications of multiple C-sections. It's the kind of operation where you do it once, and while there's a small chance of a major complication, most people come out just fine. The problem is we have women that are having now three, four, even five C-sections, and as they have higher numbers of these, they have increased risks of abnormal placentation, the surgery becomes more technically difficult, and there's risks of uh, damage to the internal organs, there's increased bleeding, and increased time of the procedure. And so um, really what we have seen is just a, a much more difficult group of C-sections that we're doing now. If you look back at the reasons that people do C-sections in the U.S., arrest of labor in its many forms, being arrest of active labor, arrest of descent, um, failure to progress, whatever you're going to call it, accounts for about 34 percent. A uh, non-reassuring fetal heart tracing accounts for about another 23 percent. Malpresentations, breach, transverse, account for about another 17 percent. Those are the, the biggest indications. Others are present as well, but those account for the majority of them. When we really look at C-section, the only things that we consider absolute indications for C-section would be something like cord prolapse, uh, placenta accreta, or previa. or other types of abnormal placentation. But there are a lot of other indications which are valid and which are important ones to consider. You can sort of think about these in uh, different categories. There's, there's fetal reasons to perform a C-section. And so something like the fetal heart tracing would be one to consider as a fetal reason. Fetal macrosomia. The recommendation um, from ACOG is that we not offer this unless a woman has an estimated fetal weight of greater than 5 kilograms if she's not diabetic and greater than 4.5 kilograms in a diabetic patient. And the reason for this is to prevent shoulder dystocia 
um, not so much that we're worried about arrest of labor, but we are trying to prevent a shoulder dystocia at the time of delivery. There are cases of maternal HIV infection in which we want to prevent transmission to the, to the baby. So cases of HIV where there's a very high viral load and the mom's not on meds would be a time to consider this. Herpes simplex infection with an active outbreak at the time of delivery is another reason to consider a C-section for a fetal reason. Certain fetal malformations. This is a little controversial because it's questionable whether the C-section actually improves the outcome, but you could consider it for things like open neural tube defects, um, hydrocephalus, um, abdominal wall defects, like omphalocele, particularly giant omphalocele, usually not for gastroschisis, but for the large uh, non-ruptured omphalocele. That would be another reason to consider it. But again, these are not absolute indications. Now there's some other, other reasons that I'll call obstetric indications, and these would be things like arrest of labor. You could also include multiple gestations in this, failed induction, however you choose to define that. And those would be some other, other commonly used reasons. There are also some maternal reasons. The thing to cons remember though when you consider this is that by and large the C-section benefits the baby more than the mother and there are very few absolute reasons to do it only for the maternal well-being. We often um, hear from women that have, say, heart disease or something, and they say, well, my doctor said, my, my cardiologist said I shouldn't have a vaginal delivery, I should only have a C-section. Well, that's not always true, and in fact, it's not true in most cases, because with uh, someone who has complex cardiac disease, the last thing we want to do is cause them to have not only a huge blood loss, but large shifts of intravascular uh, fluid all of a sudden, and that occurs during C-section. But you could still argue for a C-section for maternal reasons for someone who had uh, cervix cancer at the time of their delivery, in which case you might even consider performing hysterectomy at the time of the, the C-section. We consider offering it in women that have had a prior fourth degree laceration or a prior shoulder dystocia. This isn't universal, but it's something that many obstetricians choose to do. Um, you could also consider offering it to a woman who has what you evaluate as a greater risk of damage to her genital urinary tract or her distal um, GI tract. So somebody with a very uh, distal involvement of inflammatory bowel disease, uh, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, who might uh, not be able to heal as well should they uh, undergoes a uh, profound obstetric laceration like a fourth degree. But these are all really relative indications and that's an important thing to keep in mind. So other than the indications, uh, what are some other things to consider when we um, want to do a c-section? You want to be prepared, you want to do it well. We've already said that this accounts for a large proportion of births each year. And it's up to us as obstetricians to make sure that we do each one as well as we can. So some of the pre-op considerations would be an adequate informed consent. Are you fully informing the mom of the risks and the benefits of the procedures? And you really need to include things like there's an increased risk of bleeding over and above a vaginal delivery. There's risk of infection as we are breaking down the skin barrier to the infection, introducing bacteria potentially to the uterus or into the abdomen itself. There's a risk of damage to internal organs. And the ones that we would most consider would be the bladder, but also the bowel, rectum, Yours.
and any of those are possible during the performance of the C-section. Um, other risks that you should include in the discussion are an increased risk of venous thromboembolic disease. You should also include that there is a risk of um, a longer recovery. Wound complications like wound breakdown. And in the obese population, this happens about a third of the time, so it's fairly common. This can be anything from just a seroma in the wound to a, a larger infection, but you do have to include that. Then there's some others that are kind of down the road, complications of, for uh, future pregnancies. And the one that comes to mind usually is uterine rupture. This is the thing that we worry the most about. Uterine rupture happens about 1% of the time in a subsequent labor in a woman who's had a C-section. So it's, it's not common at all, but when it does happen, there's approximately a 20 to 25 percent risk of um, severe fetal neurologic injury or death. So it's serious when it does happen. And that's the one we, we talk about the most and we worry about the most, but you increase your risk of abnormal placentation. And this can be previa, it can be accretas, uh, percreta. And there is an increased risk of placental insufficiency. Small, but it's there. And you really need to include all of these things when you're discussing the risks with a woman who's going to have a potential C-section. Other things to consider pre-op are antibiotics, usually a single pre-op dose is given, most commonly a first-generation cephalosporin like cefazolin. Uh, you may give additional or different antibiotics based on patient allergies or whether the presence of uh, chorioamnionitis at the time of delivery is part of the um, consideration. But you do want to give a dose of antibiotics, and ideally you give this prior to making the skin incision. Within an hour of making this, the incision is probably optimal uh, to allow the antibiotic to circulate, get into the uh, maternal tissue adequately, and really do its work in preventing uh, infection. We do want to do some sort of prophylaxis against um, venous thromboembolism, and usually this consists of SCDs. Pre-op heparin isn't usually given uh, for cesareans because so many of our C-sections are done under spinal or regional anesthesia, uh, and giving anticoagulants complicates that. The other things you want to consider are um, skin prep. You do want to do an adequate skin prep. Studies have shown that chlorhexidine uh, gluconate uh, containing preps are usually better than iodine, so we want to do this. And then the usual things that apply to surgery, um, sterile draping, sterile instruments, adequate anesthesia, all of those things are important to do as well.